my name is Rich and I'm one of the pastors at the Slade and I'm so glad that you could join us this morning. And that's true whether you are a regular at the Slade or whether you've only found us since we've been unable to meet in person. It's so great that as spread out as we are, in some senses we're still able to get together, to join together, to hear God's word, to pray to him and to sing our praises to him. And that's how we're going to start by singing This Is Amazing Grace. the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Father God, we praise you that there is no God like you, that there is no God who who rules the earth, who rules the nations except you. You are the King of glory and we praise you for your unfailing love and abounding grace. We pray that this morning our eyes, our hearts would be set on you. In Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. 
Well, during these times, I hope you're, these strange times, I hope you're keeping well. And it's so important that we keep in touch with each other. And I've been so encouraged to hear of so many people doing that in so many different ways. And I, again, have been really encouraged by the take up for our home groups over Zoom. It's been great to hear so many people still being part of their groups, studying God's words together and encouraging one another. And Zoom's a great tool. Even this week, we're able to have a 20s and 30s games night, which was a lot of fun. And last Sunday, we were on Zoom, last Sunday night, we were on Zoom studying the book of Daniel. And we're going to carry that on this evening, 8 p.m. The link on Zoom is the same as it was last week. It was emailed out again on Friday. If you're not sure how to get on that, you didn't receive that link, please do contact me. I'd love to help you uh, join us. But before this evening, why not read Daniel chapter 4? And then we're going to study that this evening. And as we're studying it, we're going to pick up some tools for how we can handle and read God's word for ourselves. Next Sunday, uh, next weekend is of course the Easter weekend, which means on Friday, Good Friday, we're going to have a special service. So do come to the website at 10.30 a.m. and join us for this um, special service. And then on Sunday, as we would be normally, 10.30, and we will be on again. And now I'm going to hand over to Andy for our children's talk. Hi boys and girls, my name's Andy and I'm the youth and children's worker at The Slade. And I want to tell you another story this week from the Bible I want to tell you about someone who's really noisy and I want you to help me. I want you to shout. So I hope you're ready to be shouting. Every time you see this thing come up, I want you to shout what is on it. There's only two words. It's really simple. There's just oi and no. Okay, hopefully you can do that. The person in the Bible I want to talk to you about is a man named Peter. And he was one of Jesus' followers. And he was really, really loud. He would go around and he would say, Oi! You over there. Did you shout that time? Get ready for this. Oi! Get me that! He had a really big mouth and he liked shouting. Now there's something else you need to know about Peter. He loved fish. He loved to eat fish. He loved to catch fish. Oh, he just loved fish. Fish were the best. Do you know what? One time, he even had fish for breakfast. Weird, hey? But we'll get to that a bit later. Well, he became a follower of Jesus this way. He was just hanging around one day, and Jesus came up to him and said, Listen, Peter, I want you to catch fish. Sorry. I want you to catch people not fish anymore. I want you to come and tell them that God loves them and God wants them to turn back to him, to repent, to come back to God. Come with me, follow me and catch people, not fish. So Peter did. He became one of Jesus' best, best friends. And they would hang out together and Peter watched Jesus do all kinds of miracles turn water into wine to make blind people see make deaf people hear and then Jesus started talking about God's plan God's plan that he would die one day and Peter was really sad and couldn't really understand about this anyway one day in a garden Jesus told his followers listen all of you when I'm arrested are going to abandon me Well, you know what Peter did? No, he shouted. I'll never do that. Jesus turned around to Peter and he said, listen, Peter, three times, one, two, three, you're going to deny that you knew me. Before the cock crows in the morning, three times, you're going to deny it. What? Never, said Peter. Well, anyway, very soon the soldiers came and they arrested Jesus and they took him away to be tried. Peter followed at a distance and he sat down by a fire, warming himself up. And a girl came over to him and she said, listen, aren't you one of those followers of Jesus? No, Peter said. I don't know Jesus. One time. 
Not long after this, someone else came up to Peter and said, I kind of recognise you. Aren't you one of those Jesus followers? No, Peter said. I don't know Jesus. Two times. Well, not long after this, someone else came up to Peter and said, I think I recognise you. You hang out with that Jesus fella, don't you? No, I don't know Jesus. One, two, three. And then the rooster crowed. Jesus looked straight at Peter. Peter knew what he had done. Was Jesus going to ever speak to him again? Was Jesus ever going to forgive him? Was he ever going to be his friend again? Peter didn't know. Jesus went on to die. Jesus went on to rise again. Peter was going to see Jesus again. What would he say? What would happen? What was he going to do? We'll find out next week. But I just want to tell you boys and girls. This thing. That Peter, he went through life. The first part of his life. Thinking I can do this all on my own. I'm following Jesus and I'm big enough and I'm tough enough. And yet he wasn't, was he? He forgot to depend on God. And listen, this week, maybe you're going through some tough stuff. Well, don't try and do it on your own. Pray to God. Pray to our Father in heaven. We're going to sing a song about that now about praying, not trying to do things on our own, but praying to our Father in heaven. So get your actions, stand up, have a little dance around. Grown-ups, come on, join in too. And we're going to sing, Father, you are King of heaven now. Let's sing this now. Father, you are King of heaven and greater than us all. Everything is in your hands, from huge right down to small. Sometimes I forget that I can't do things on my own. Please now help me pray to you and trust in you alone. It's like an iPhone trying to do press ups, like a potato trying to swim, like a mountain trying to brush its teeth. When we don't rely on him When we pray we trust our Father That's what Jesus said So I'll stop trusting in myself And pray to God instead Father help me now to pray And spend some time with you Like a potato trying to swim Like a mountain trying to brush its teeth When we don't rely on him When we pray we trust our Father That's what Jesus said So I'll stop trusting in myself And pray to God instead It's like a Like a potato trying to swim Like a mountain trying to brush its teeth When we don't rely on him When we pray we trust our Father That's what Jesus said So I'll stop trusting in myself And pray to God instead Well, this Sunday is traditionally Palm Sunday, the time when we remember Jesus' triumphant arrival in Jerusalem as the crowds flock to him to praise him. But last week, we we skipped over that as we started our mini-series. We jumped straight 
to the final hours of Jesus' life as we saw him praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And today we're on to the cross, the crucifixion itself. Now there's so much in here, of course, and we're going to be looking at it again on Good Friday. And our reading today is a bit longer, so we've broken it up into three. And I've asked each of our three readers to share a thought about Easter. And Ronke's up first, and then after her we're going to go into our next song, which for my money there is no better Easter song than Man of Sorrows. Good morning. Today's reading is taken from the book of Matthew 27, verses 35 to 43. And that's Matthew 27, verses 35 to 43. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed a written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right hand and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. Verse 43. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. People wonder why the cross is good news for us. For me, this is because Jesus dying has granted me access to, the, to God's divine forgiveness, mercy and peace. He has paid the ultimate price. Man of sorrows, Lamb of God, by his own. Sunset's free, oh, it's free indeed. 
time for our second reading and it's Natalie who's been busy with some Easter crafts with her girls. Good morning, I will be reading from Matthew chapter 27 verse 45 to 50. Before I do that I just wanted to share some of the artwork, some arts and crafts that my daughters have done over this week as we consider Easter. We have done some lovely paintings. He is risen and we also covered this cross in foot fingerprints and they put their fingerprints on it as we discussed how Jesus died for every single one of us so this will be going up on our fridge for the next week or so so Matthew chapter 27 verse 45 to 50 from the sixth hour until the ninth hour darkness came over all the land about the ninth hour Jesus cried out in a loud voice Eloi, Eloi, lama, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Well, if you've got young children at home, why don't you try some Easter crafts over this week? And also, just below the video that you're watching, there are some resources for families to see how you can look at the Easter story this week as well. So do check those out. It's now time for our, our last reading, and it's going to be Jenny, who's going to read, and then she's going to pray for us as we hear God's word. And straight after her, it's going to be Wes. I've been asked to say why the cross is special to me and it's because 66 years ago I realised that Jesus had paid the price for my sin on the cross and I found him to be a wonderful saviour and my hope. And now I'm going to read from Matthew 27 verses 54 to 56. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. Now I'm going to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, 
We pray for the situation in the world, the fear that many feel, the isolation and the sadness of relatives unable to be with loved ones who are very ill. Also for all those who daily put their lives at risk as they care for others. We pray too for the government in the decisions they have to make that you will give them the wisdom they need. Amongst all the uncertainties, may there be those who come to realise there is a certain hope that can be found in your beloved Son, the Lord Jesus. We pray for Wes as he brings us your word, that he may know your presence and we might hear and understand. We ask all of this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, who did it? Who's to blame? Growing up as one of four children, I sometimes heard that asked. But being one of those rare children who nearly always was obedient, I could only stand there dismayed at the other's behaviour, waiting for one of them to own up. Now in the middle of this virus crisis, while those tackling it are trying their best. Comparisons are being made now on how different countries are seeing different results. And inevitably, questions arise. Some are asking, and maybe you've asked, why aren't we doing it their way to prevent and contain the virus? Who's to blame? The blame game, though, can become very ugly especially when the experts in their advice uh, have been overwhelmed by all of this. We need to really keep praying for them and for our leaders in such difficult times. However, at times it is essential to understand where the blame lies when it comes to crimes and miscarriages of justice. That's why we have a criminal justice system so that justice can prevail so that the innocent can go free and so that the guilty can be justly punished and deterred from doing wrong again. Speaking of crimes, today we're looking at the most brutal of them all, the betrayal, arrest and subsequent crucifixion of a completely innocent man, Jesus. I want us, by looking at the Bible, to examine some of the key characters and decide who really was to blame. No surprise, the first suspect, Judas. Let me read from Matthew 26, verse 7. While Jesus was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man, arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus was heartlessly betrayed by one of his very own hand-picked disciples. It, It beggars belief, doesn't it? Maybe some of you have known betrayal by someone you love, even perhaps worse still, someone that you thought loved you. Surely that's one of the most painful things anyone can experience. Well, about Judas, we're told elsewhere in the Bible that Satan entered him and we're also told that Judas was a thief. He helped himself on occasion secretly to the group's funds. So when he was offered money to betray Jesus, he just couldn't resist. It's shocking though, isn't it? But aren't so many things that we ourselves have done, if we're honest, things that we never would have imagined that we would have said or done, and especially to those that we love most? Next, Peter, the disciple, was he to blame? When Jesus told his disciples that he was going to be arrested and die and that they'd all abandon him, uh, up stepped Peter and boasted, Lord, Lord, no, no, not, not me. Okay, maybe the others will, but I'm even prepared to die for you. To which Jesus replied, Peter, 
before the cock crows, you'll deny me three times. Here we see Peter following at a distance as Jesus has been arrested. And he gets asked, not once, but twice, if he knows Jesus and is one of his followers. Sure enough, Peter denies it. And then listen as it's picked up in chapter 26 of Matthew, verse 73. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you're one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a cock crowed and Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken. Before the cock crows, you will disown me three times. He went outside and wept bitterly. Peter, you must be to blame for Jesus' death. You promised to protect him, even die for him. How tough we can appear at times when it's all quiet. We can talk about, oh, what we do and all this bravery and action. But then when the tough times do come, it's maybe often different. Perhaps if you're a Christian, maybe you even remember when you first became a Christian, you, you couldn't wait to tell the world of your newfound faith and your trust in Jesus. And you were, you were going to tell everyone. Well, it's a number of years now and, well, it's a little bit tricky to tell others that you love and trust and follow Jesus because, well, not everybody understands and you don't want to put them off, you don't want to offend them. And you've done a Peter, really. Maybe not full denial, but you've certainly done that, not done that big, bold initial, I'm going to proclaim it to the world. Isn't there a bit of Peter in every single one of us? Failed expectations that we set ourselves. What about thirdly, blaming the religious leaders for Jesus' death? Well, they've been out for Jesus from day one. Ever since he turned up on their patch and the crowds, the congregation basically left them and started following Jesus. And Jesus also saw straight through them. He saw straight through their fake hypocrisy, that outward religion that they had, all for show, just because they loved the adulation and the honour of the people, while their hearts were corrupt. And so as Jesus on countless occasions named and shamed them, no wonder they wanted him dead and were delighted when Judas, one of Jesus' own disciples, agreed to betray him. They set up their own kangaroo court as he's been arrested. And they ask him this question. They ask Jesus if he is the Messiah. Jesus replies he is. We pick it up in Matthew 26 verse 65. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look now you've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spat in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him. But they had a problem. Even though they'd found him guilty and deserving of death, they were in a Roman occupied land. And it meant they had no power to execute him. So they dragged him off to the Roman governor in charge of their region. Pilate. Later, while Jesus is hanging on the cross, uh, this same religious group come and they approach him. We read in Matthew 27, verse 41, the chief priests, teachers of the law and elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we'll believe him. So vicious and cruel. Just an aside here for all of us who know and love Jesus. We believe, of course, that he had the power to come down instantly from the cross. But the only reason he didn't? So saving himself was so he could save others. 
Little did they realise as they taunted him, if there had been no death and sacrifice of Jesus on the cross in our place, there would be no salvation for any of us. Oh, praise our Jesus, that as he listened to those evil taunts, he ignored them and he stayed there. He hung there, he bled and he died, not saving himself so he could save us. But what about the next one? The big boss, Pilate. I mean, after all, wasn't he in charge of everything? Nothing happened without his say-so. So he thought. At one point, as Pilate's getting exasperated with Jesus because Jesus wouldn't defend himself, Pilate says, don't you realise I've got the power to free or crucify you? To which Jesus replied, you have no power over me except that which God has given you. From then on, the big man's desperate. He becomes the small man. He knows Jesus is innocent. He knows he's only been handed over by these corrupt men out of anger and jealousy. But everything Pilate does fails. He tries to use the custom of releasing one criminal a year during the Jewish Passover, uh, which it now was. And we pick it up in Matthew 27 and verse 20. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? Asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why, what crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. But he had Jesus flogged and handed over to them to be crucified. Some of the world's leaders, mentioning no names, seem to be floundering at the moment. Just like Pilate, it's, it's all big talk one moment. And then the next, again like Pilate, they're backing down. Because despite all their power, they're finding they're utterly clueless and helpless. We may not be like Pilate and other world leaders with all their supposed power, but like them, we are all also clueless and helpless when it comes to saving ourselves or anyone else, powerless to control our own destiny. Next, the crowd. Are they to blame? Now today, this Sunday is traditionally Palm Sunday. The week before Jesus was crucified, he entered Jerusalem on the donkey. Crowds were praising him, waving palm, palm leaves, saying, praising him, Hosanna. Basically exalting this great king who'd come to deliver them. But five days later, on the very first Good Friday, here crowds, now we don't know if they're the same, but crowds were screaming for him to be crucified. What a fickle world we live in. Crowds followed Jesus throughout his earthly ministry, amazed at his miracles. But as you follow that through the life of Jesus, as Jesus does perhaps a few less miracles towards the end of his ministry, and he teaches more and more, and being very direct on the need for everyone to repent of the wrong they've done, the people drop off. They were only really interested in the miracles and what was in it for them. That's tragic and yet it's still so similar today. Now people don't mind a, a, a Jesus in a manger. A healer of the sick, one who cares for the poor. Maybe even someone who rebukes those ridiculous, pompous religious leaders like he did. But a Jesus who came to die on the cross for our sin and shame who calls us to repentance and faith in him, submitting our lives to him daily, 
No, I'm okay, thanks. We want Barabbas. Sorry, who's Barabbas? Well, Barabbas is anyone. Anyone will do except Jesus. Tomorrow it'll be someone else that we're chasing after and we want rather than Jesus. As a child, all my family were from Liverpool. And growing up, when it came to choosing a football team, there were only two choices, of course. The two best teams in the world. Liverpool and Liverpool Reserves. Oh, no, sorry. Um, not to offend my family. There's another team apparently called Everton. But despite the fact that all my family supported Everton, things went a little bit different for me. I had a granddad who worked as a printer and he did some work for both of the clubs. My older brother and I would get these free posters. And the team, yes, I admit in blue, they did look smart. But they just lacked something the team in red had. The red team's photos had these big silver trophies in front of them. So to my shallow shame as a seven-year-old, I chose the red team. Most people seemed to be cheering for Barabbas when Pilate offered them the choice of who they wanted, Jesus or Pilate, to be freed. So everyone joined in. Yes, give us Barabbas. Most people seem to want Jesus to be crucified. So then everyone joined in. Yes, crucify Jesus. Popular opinion today still rejects Jesus and his claims on our lives. By far the mass, vast majority in the UK, uh, over 95%, they don't want Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. They reject the truth that he comes to share. That we need him and we need his salvation because we're lost without him. We need his rule and reign in our lives. Tragically, today like back then, the vast majority were hopelessly lost and wrong. Next suspects, the soldiers. Now, if Roman soldiers were good at anything, it was cold-blooded, brutal executions. Matthew 27, verse 28 reads, The soldiers stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spat on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they'd mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. No mercy, whatever. It's hard to imagine how anyone could be so cruel, but many countries, uh, when they've faced civil wars, have seen such unbelievable brutality. In fact, neighbours and friends overnight have become the bitterest of enemies. Bosnia, Rwanda, Sudan, Congo, Iraq, Darfur, Yemen have seen thousands upon thousands slaughtered just in the last 20 or 30 years. But go back further into last century. Millions in civil wars were killed in Nigeria, Vietnam, Korea, China, Russia... Germany as a whole nation, not only once but twice, en masse, followed their wicked leaders into two world wars, resulting in 80 million people losing their lives. Most of us still don't comprehend tragically what we're capable of and going along with. It's so naive of us to imagine that, oh, well, if we've lived in Germany or Bosnia or Rwanda, of course, we'd have reacted differently. Would you? Would I? If that's the way we think, we're delusional. We're kidding ourselves of the state of our very own hearts and what they're capable of. Now, yes, admittedly, many of us, hopefully all of us, are capable of doing the most wonderful, kind, caring, loving acts. Why is that? Well, the Bible tells us we're all made in God's image. We're made to reflect him and be like him. 
But when we throw off God's influence, and when we want to live our own way, the Bible says of our very own hearts, they are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So much so that we can't even understand them. So where are we at? And who's actually to blame for the death of Jesus? I trust we're all honest enough to admit at our need of a saviour to come and to die for us for all the wrong that we've done. Jesus died in our place so that we might be forgiven. If you don't believe that truth, what, why on earth did Jesus die then? But in all this account of the cross, from Jesus' very own lips, he doesn't seem to be blaming anyone. In fact, as they crucify him, he calls out, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Astonishingly, Jesus is still full of and praying for forgiveness on those who'd carried out the greatest crime and injustice ever. But from Jesus' very own lips is the greatest of hints of who ultimately allowed all this to happen and actually could have stopped this happening. Jesus cries out in verse 45 of Matthew 27, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God the Father and the Son had always lived in perfect harmony but now were separated. That is why uh, Jesus' soul, we saw last week in Gethsemane, was described as being overwhelmed even to the point of death because he knew this is what lay before him. We said last week, and I'll say again, because God is holy and perfect and cannot look on sin. So while Jesus hung on the cross, taking our place, bearing God's anger and punishment for our sin, the father needed to turn away and forsake his son. Amazing. So God the father could have stopped all this, but he didn't. So is it him we blame? Most definitely not. It was for our sin that Jesus died. The blame is not on anyone but us. Along with everyone else mentioned, Judas and Peter and Pilate, the religious leaders, the crowd, the soldiers and so on. But it was God the Father's plan all along. He was in control, orchestrating all these events, even allowing the brutality of this to happen to his own precious son. Why? So that you and me could be set free. So you and me could find forgiveness as we cry out to him and ask. So that you and me could be finally like our last character. The centurion. The one who witnessed all this. He was the one in charge of the group of soldiers who crucified Jesus. So if anyone was to blame, surely it was him. He would have been a professional, hard-bitten soldier, no doubt, but look what he says as he witnessed the whole death of Jesus. He would have been there from beginning to end. He would have heard every gracious word that came from the lips of Jesus. Words of love, words of forgiveness, words of concern for others. He'd have also heard that anguished cry to the Father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But after all this happened in verse 54, what do we read there of Matthew 27? He and along with others was terrified and exclaimed, surely this man was the son of God. He'd finally got it. But perhaps he was terrified because he thought it was all too late. He'd been in charge of killing not just an innocent man, but the very son of God. Yet he was only terrified because he didn't know the end of the story, which of course we'll be looking at next week, when three days later, 
Jesus rose again victorious from the grave. So how will we respond to Jesus? Surely not like any of the previous characters we've looked at, who responded towards Jesus in anger, in greed, in cowardice, in selfishness, in pride, in mockery, in dismissiveness, in unbelief, in hard-heartedness. But surely broken-heartedness, like the centurion. Realising who Jesus is. And maybe you did that and you became a Christian years ago. But what a great opportunity again now to just be lost in the fact that Almighty God sent his son to die for you. And to be overwhelmed and thrilled and moved and challenged and changed by that even more. Or maybe you're overwhelmed. And you feel you need to confess for the very first time your, your sin and your need to put your trust in Jesus. Do you know the depth of God the Father's love for you? That he actually planned and allowed all this to happen to Jesus as we've studied here this morning for you and for me? Oh, how we, we, we need to go to God, whoever we are, and thank him. Thank him for the cross. Thank him for his love displayed in sacrificing his only begotten son for us. Because if he hadn't, there would be no forgiveness. There would be no rescue. There would be no ransom. The last song that we're going to sing now speaks of God's love and his wonderful plan to save us through the death of of his son on the cross. If you believe it to be true, sing your heart out. If not, or you're confused or considering these things, why not take the time to pause and reflect on the words you're about to see and realize your great need of Jesus and simply cry out to him for mercy. Amen. Jesus Christ, his 
this morning and let's pray as we close father god we do thank and praise you for your great salvation plan that plan that cost you so very much father we ask for your forgiveness for all our failures for all our rebellions and yet we thank you that jesus has paid for every single one of them pray that that would be a precious thought to us that we would keep hold of through this week in Jesus' name, Amen. Well, just a reminder that Friday, Good Friday, 10.30am, do click on the website to join us for that special service. Then we'll be back on Sunday as well. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battle. Slain for the sins of the world, his blood breaks the